Hello, Jeff Zwerink here, and welcome to Science Faith Connection, the segment of our show where we explore important scientific ideas and see how they relate to the truth of Christianity. Today I'm joined in studio with Dr. Hugh Ross, and we're going to be talking about the Genesis Flood. Hugh, it's good to have you here today. Well, thank you, Jeff. So the flood uh, stands as one of those big biblical events that has a lot of importance that it seems like it's got a lot of scientific connection. Uh, I know some are saying that maybe it's not a real event or maybe it's describing theological concepts, but I just thought I'd start off our discussion today asking you, why do you think the Bible's describing a real historical event in the flood? Well, I see nothing in what the Bible describes about the flood that would contradict anything we know from the scientific record. So it's certainly scientifically feasible. Uh, I wouldn't go so far to say we can scientifically prove it. Mm -hmm. It's an event that happened too long ago, and it was a relatively brief event. The Bible tells us the flood waters rose for five months and subsided for seven months, so it's a relatively brief event. And the brevity of the event, and given how long ago it happened, uh, not just a few thousand years ago, but tens of thousands of years ago, means that we wouldn't have any anticipation of any really significant scientific signature. So any sort of geological features that would be left over from it, is, is that the kind of thing you're talking about? The or? only thing I know of that could possibly be a signature, there's some geological evidence, significant geological evidence, that there was a berm that was broken at the mouth of the Gulf of Hormuz, uh, which would have permitted a massive sudden rush of water in from the Indian Ocean, and that may have been one of several contributors to the flood water. But other than that, I don't really know uh, of any scientific evidence we could point to. On the other hand, given what the Bible says about it, I don't anticipate finding any. Okay, very good. So let, let's maybe take a step back and ask a question. Um, and your reading of the text, you know, Genesis 6 through Genesis 9 talks about the flood. Um, from a biblical perspective, what do you expect the flood to look like? Uh, you know, like what's its extent? How, you know, just what would you expect if you were back at the time looking at it? Sure. Well, it tells us in 2 Peter 2, 5 that it was the world of ungodly people that was flooded. The people and the soulish animals that were associated with them. Mm -hmm. So the question for the extent of the flood was how far had ungodly people inhabited the earth? And what you notice in uh, Genesis, you don't really see any place names outside of the Persian Gulf region until you get to Genesis 10, post-flood. And so, and you got God commanding the post-flood peoples, multiply and fill the earth, which is an implication that they were not obeying the command that God had given to Adam to multiply and fill the earth. And so that would be one piece of evidence that the flood was a regional event, not a global event. And that's affirmed by what we see in Psalm 104. Psalm 104 is the longest of the creation psalms, takes you through the content of the six creation days, not in chronological order, but it does address the content. And in Psalm 104, verses 6 to 8, it's talking about how God transformed the surface of the earth mm -hmm. from a water world to where he got oceans and continents, a clear reference to creation day three. Uh, but what it says in verse 9 is that never again will water cover the whole face of the earth. And so I would indicate that uh, there would be uh, no biblical possibility of a global flood uh, after God establishes continents on the face of the earth. So, so your position is, and your position here at RTB is that the flood is a real event, one that uh, wiped out all of humanity. So presumably the extent of godless man is the extent of humanity. Right. And one where, you know, just based on what scripture has to say that the flood didn't actually cover the whole earth. Uh, how, how large of a flood are we talking about though? I mean, we've had lots of floods. Sure. I mean, even back in the 1990s, it was a pretty sizable flood back in the Midwest. Sure, well, uh, I think we can be confident there weren't ungodly people building cities in Antarctica. Mm -hmm. So no need for God to flood Antarctica and humans wouldn't have had contact with the emperor penguins. Mm -hmm. So those emperor penguins wouldn't have been damaged by human sin. Mm -hmm. There'd be no need for God to wipe out the emperor penguins and you can probably make the same argument for Greenland. And I'm comfortable with, given what I see in Genesis 10 and 11, that the flood to wipe out all of humanity wouldn't need to encompass, say, more than a million, two million square miles in the Middle Eastern region uh, surrounding the Persian Gulf. I think it was at least a half million square miles, but unlikely to be more than two million square miles. 
So this is a very large flood. It's a large but nonetheless flood. Nonetheless, a flood that is geographically local in that sense. Right. Catastrophic enough to wipe out all of humanity, all the animals associated with it. So why do you think it's important that it wiped out all of humanity? I mean, what, you know, is that a scientific statement, a, a biblical statement? It's more of a biblical statement, Jeff, because, I mean, one study I've done is to go through the entire Old Testament and look at all the occasions where God is having to deal uh, surgery, moral, moral surgery, where he's removing the cancerous reprobation within the human population. Probably the most explicit example of that is Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, where mm -hmm. God uh, wipes out the human population of the five cities of the plain. But you've got Abraham saying, well, what about these wicked Amorites that are living up in the hills with me? And God says their wickedness has not yet reached its fullness. I will not touch them. Mm -hmm. And so God evidently limits his judgment wrath to the extent of human reprobation, where human reprobation is defined as individuals that are incapable of thinking, doing, or saying anything good. They're intent on doing physical harm to all the people around them. And we see that well described in Gomorrah when the uh, two angelic mm -hmm. visitors come in. So, so we've got a very large but local or regional flood, one that encompasses all of humanity at the time. A universal flood. Universal flood, right. right. I think that's, that's, that's critical. Um, so what would you say to the person, you know, the, you know the, the Christian who says, you know, well, you're talking about this large flood that's, that's local but doesn't have any scientific evidence. Why do you think this is even a historical event? What in the text indicates to you that it's not just talking about God's judging principles as opposed to an actual historical event? Well, I look at uh, Genesis 6, 7, and 8, and it's written in historical uh, context. I mean, I can't find a way to read those texts and read them as an allegory or a figure of speech. It literally is written as real history that happened. And so I can put to the test the Bible's inerrancy, the fact that we've got lots of external evidence uh, for the full inerrancy of the Bible tells me, hey, if this is written as history, it's real history. So one last question. Do you think we will ever find scientific data that uh, corroborates or points to, hey, yeah, this was Noah's flood? Will we find artifacts from the humans that were living before or geological sediments or something like well, that? Well, we might if the flood was, say, uh, a thousand years ago. And you know, people often will look at the genealogies and claim there's no gaps. I believe there has to be gaps mm -hmm. in the genealogy. Moreover, it tells us uh, that it took uh, almost a year for the floodwaters to recede away. For it to take that long for the floodwaters to recede, there would have to be huge amounts of uh, melting snow and ice, kind of like the big floods that have happened here in America, mm -hmm. where you get the big floods is because you got a huge amount of snow and ice melt uh, from the past winter. And so uh, that would uh, tell me uh, that we're dealing with something that happened during the last ice age because that's how far you got to go in order to have significant amounts of ice and snow on the mountains that surround that region. Well, thanks, Hugh. I appreciate your comments. You know, it is the case when you read through Genesis, there's lots of places where Genesis is describing things that happen in history, but, uh, and, and they have a scientific relevance that we can go out and investigate. You know, I would encourage you to go to reasons.org and check out Hugh's blog on this topic. It was, Did Any Human Survive the Flood? It will give you access to some of his thoughts on this as well as other resources you can use that help you see that what the Bible describes and what we find as we study creation line up and give us tools to share the gospel with others.